Executive Director of the Atlantic Council's Adrian Arst Latin America Center. I'm delighted to open this incredibly important event on the future of immunization programs and financing in Latin America and the Caribbean. Today we have a truly fantastic group of experts that are gathered virtually, and I want to thank all of our speakers for joining us. Dr. Rodrigo Enriquez, Ecuadorian Health Ministries General Coordinator of System and Resource Sustainability. Dr. Anupama Tantri, Merck's Executive Director for Global Access, Affordability, and Financing Public Policies. Dr. Ana Elena Chavez, PAHU's Regional Immunization Advisor for Polio. And Dr. Miguel Betancourt Cravioto, Independent Consultant and former Director of Global Solutions at the Carlos Slim Foundation. I'd also like to thank Merck and Company for supporting this event. The Atlantic Council is extremely pleased to partner with Merck to contribute to vital thought leadership on regional health issues. Today's discussion will explore opportunities, impediments, and key leverage points for improving immunization program outcomes and broader health system resilience across the region, with a focus on the critically important aspect of financing. This event also launches our latest report, The Future of Immunization Financing in Latin America and the Caribbean, co-authored by Adrian Arce Latin America Center, Associate Director and Fellow Pepe Zhang, and our speaker, Dr. Miguel Betancourt Cravioto. With many countries achieving high COVID vaccination rates and recording considerably lower levels of COVID deaths, we are optimistic about our region's pandemic outlook in the near term. But as we look back at the relative success the region has had in this vaccination campaign, we also can't help but notice several deficiencies in our country's immunization programs and overall health systems, including the disruptions in routine vaccination and other regular health services caused by COVID vaccinations, logistical challenges, growing budgetary constraints, unequal access, and other issues. Identifying these gaps, applying the lessons learned from this pandemic in a forward-looking way, and outlining actionable recommendations is critical to addressing these deficiencies. It will also allow us to meaningfully look beyond the pandemic and ensure that our immunization and broader health systems are more resilient and better prepared against current and future needs. This is imperative for the region's broader socioeconomic prosperity, even beyond immediate health concerns. This forward-looking ethos cuts across all bodies of work in the Adrian Arts Latin America Center, including health. That's why earlier last year, we created a content series titled The Future of Health in the Americas. Today's discussion is the fourth installment of this series, but actually the first public one. In previous sessions, we focus on other key policy issues at the intersection of health and the economy, as well as the importance of public-private multilateral collaboration. The report released today is our hashtag Future of Health publication. We hope to continue to facilitate these multi-stakeholder dialogues and collaboration among experts and look forward to engaging you during and beyond today's discussion. I'll now hand it over to my colleague, Pepe Zeng, who will moderate today's conversation. Pepe, over to you. Thank you, Jason. And like Jason, I'd like to thank all of our speakers today for taking the time to join us for this incredibly important hashtag future of health conversation. And a quick correction that Dr. Ana Elena Chavez's title is Senior Regional Advisor for the Revolving Fund at PAHO. Now, just to compliment a couple of things that Jason said before we go right into the conversation here, um, an important feature of the health, future of health content series for us is this multi-stakeholder dialogue and collaboration. We want to help build consensus among the public sector, the private sector, and the multilateral sectors. And today's panel indeed reflects this multi-stakeholder multi approach. And I'm really excited to hear the different perspectives coming from these um, different sectors. And I just want to quickly contextualize why we decided to write this report and why it's absolutely important for us to organize this conversation today, especially in an area where all of us are having more than enough Zoom meetings. Um, and one thing you know I've been very frustrated about is just the fact that in our region, as a region, we have always underprioritized health. This is health policy, health sector, health economy. While we finally prioritize health issues and given them the, the attention they deserve during this once in a century pandemic, it seems increasingly that as we exit the pandemic, health policy issues are going back to their pre-pandemic normal, which is once again, underappreciated, underinvested, in many ways underestimated. So this sort of backsliding and, and short-term memory to me, that's, that's a very dangerous mistake. 
and will definitely have long-term human and uh, economic consequences as the pandemic has showed us in, in the most painful way possible. So our goal is to, to use our research, the Atlantic Council's research and the convening power to help us keep the eye on the ball and remind governments, companies, citizens and multilateral organizations that simply health matters. In the case of today's event, uh, in the report, we want to underscore the issue of immunization programs and financing, which is once again, a good example of something that is so important that received a lot of attention in the past two years, but seems like it's sadly getting forgotten again and taking a back seat in many countries. Now, going into the discussion, um, the first question, perhaps I'll pose it to uh, Dr. Chevet and then to, to Dr. Enriquez, just thinking about routine immunization, which is something that perhaps a lot of other folks not following this topic closely are not just paying attention to this. Uh, we know that the, the pandemic has significantly impacted regular health services and that includes immunization. We see, we saw a lot of redirection of financial and human resources. We saw supply chain and disruptions. We saw mobility restrictions at the height of the pandemic. Now that the pandemic subsided, however, we still, we still see that the regular immunization programs in many countries has not fully recovered in our region. And that obviously puts a population at risk of uh, vaccine preventable diseases. So perhaps we kick it off with uh, with you, Dr. Chavez, to give us a regional overview seen from the perspective of PAHO, and then we go to Dr. Enriquez to give us some specific uh, uh, examples in the case of Ecuador. Thank you, Pepe, and thank you all. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me and for PAHO to be participating in this panel. Um, regarding your question, Definitely, as you know, the Pan American Health Organization, PAHO, is the oldest uh, international public health agency providing technical cooperation and mobilizing partnership. So, this gives the organization an accumulated wealth of experience and lessons learned. So, going back to your question, definitely we will, uh, we knew that this was going to happen. We were, we expected this to happen and we prepared for it. In fact, just 15 days after the declaration of the pandemic, PAHO published a document that provides countries and territories recommendation to how to continue providing a routine immunization uh, program in the context of the, of the pandemic. These recommendations were based on the lessons learned that we review after the Ebola uh, epidemic in 2014, 2015 in the affected countries. The statistic clearly showed that during this pandemic of Ebola, there was an increased number of uh, cases and deaths for measles, malaria, HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis. And in fact, the number of deaths due to these diseases were even higher than the Ebola cases. So for this reason, reason, it was recommended that the immunization program in the Americas should be considered as an essential health service that should not be interrupted during the pandemic. Perhaps here, it is important to mention that at the same time that we were facing the COVID-19 pandem COVID pandemic, other emergencies situation happened in our region. And sometimes we forget about this situation which of course affected the implementation of the routine immunization program, and of course also affected the economic perspective of, of the economic investment that countries were making. And just to mention some, the massive migration in South America, in Brazil, Colombia, and Miguel country, Ecuador, Guyana, Peru, Suriname, and Trinidad and Tobago. The hurricane Eta and Yota in what, that affected Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Colombia the volcanic eruption in St. Vincent and Grenadines, the earthquake in Haiti, the hurricane Elsa in Barbados, St. Vincent and Grenadines and Haiti, the monkeypox that was declared a public health emergency of international concern, the de deteriorating situation, security situation in Haiti, the declaration of a CBDPD or vaccine-derived poliovirus in the United States, and finally, the cholera outbreak in Haiti and Dominican Republic. So yes, we are called to talk about the impact of the COVID pandemic, but in fact, there are other events, emergencies that have affected the routine immunization, uh, the implementation of the routine immunization program in the Americas. And this is just to mention some of them. When I asked my colleague from the emergency department to share with me the list, Believe me, I can, I can be talking here for 15 minutes, just mentioning all those emergencies. So, and the response to this emergency was aggravated definitely by the situation of the pandemic 
and impacted health service, including re the regular or routine immunization program. So in summary, my first point is that it was not only COVID-19 that affected the operationalization of the immunization program in the region. However, the sum of all these unprecedented challenges has caused definitely a setback in vaccination coverage. And of course, all these have caused significant, uh, significant economic stress to families and governments. Recently, just last month, the strategic advisory group of experts immunization that we call the SAGE expressed its concern on the increased number of children that have never been vaccinated, those that we call the zero dose. Uh, the impact has widespread regardless of the income level of the countries. So we see several countries in the Americas affected. Among 10 countries around the world, uh, 62 uh, they accumulate 62% of the children that are zero dose as of December, 2021. In the case of the region of the Americas, Brazil is among uh, these 10 countries. When we compare how was the vaccination covers for DPT vaccine, which protects against diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus. In 20, two, 10 years ago, it was 93%. Currently, or as of December 2021, the coverage dropped to 80%. So this clearly showed the impact of the pandemic, uh, although all the efforts made by our countries. But I want to stress that our country has not remained still. In the midst of the pandemic, we have seen pictures in the, in the social media of committed healthcare workers going house to house. New vaccination were implemented in several countries. We started to see pictures from Paraguay and from Chile where this drive through like a McDonald's uh, drive through were implemented to vaccinate children. Little by little, this strategy was implemented everywhere. By September, 2022, when uh, COVID-19 vaccine were not available yet, countries of the America conducted the influenza vaccination and more than 100 million people were vaccinated. The target was 110 million. We reached 100 million, including healthcare workers, elderly, children under five years of age and uh, pregnant women. And this was done during the pandemic. So it's affected us. But we, the countries and territory didn't remain still. They responded. They never stopped it. And you mentioned the vaccination week in the Americas. This was never stopped. Last year, we, this year, we celebrated the 20th anniversary of the, of the vaccination week of the America. Before, this was a party. We used to dance, have music, children, family coming to celebrate vaccination. Not this time. This was, was virtual, but we keep uh, moving and we never stop. Definitely, uh, there, are, there are issues to address, like uh, the uh, outbreak of, of missiles that have affected several countries in the Americas. However, countries have conducted their, their vaccination campaign that we call for missiles, that we call the follow-up campaigns. And uh, in 2022, no, let me give you the data for 2021, yes. In 2021, um, Bolivia, Colombia, Mexico, and Paraguay conducted vaccine, high quality vaccination campaigns. In these countries, 16 million, close to 17 million children from one to 10 years were vaccinated against measles with a coverage, average of coverage of 92%. In this year, 21 million children from one to six years of age were vaccinated. As of October 10, 10.9 million children have been vaccinated during campaigns, and only three countries have completed, and already three countries have completed their vaccination campaign, Brazil, Dominican Republic, and Nicaragua, while four countries are still in process of finishing their campaign, Argentina, El Salvador, Honduras, and Venezuela. And we celebrate that Miguel countries getting ready for next year to have a major vaccination campaign against measles and uh, polio. So recovery will require addressing the root of causes of, of this low vaccination coverage. But I want to stress that countries never stop and have done an amazing job in the midst of this pandemic. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Chavez. I like the, the optimistic message here saying that countries never stop doing the good things. And, you know, one thing you said at the, at the top, you know, that this is we are living in an increasingly shock prone world. There's going to be overlapping shocks, overlapping crises, overlapping emergencies, the long list you mentioned. So one thing that Miguel and I wrote about, and I think all of us here can agree, is that we want to make sure that there is going to be that surge capacity to deliver something uh, like the pandemic vaccine, but in the meantime, maintaining also the regular health service, and that includes regular immunization. So thank you for that. And, and, uh, and then we'll go to uh, Dr. Enrique to tell us specifically about the case of Ecuador, which at least in the case of you know COVID-19 vaccines was certainly held as a regional and global success. But tell us a little bit more about the, the routine immunization situation, how that has recovered comparing to uh, what, what Dr. Chavez has said earlier at a regional level. And perhaps after that, I can have, uh, have Miguel and An Anupama also jump in and react to some of the comments have been provided so far. Thank you, Pepe, and it, it's a pleasure to join this high-level panel to discuss this really important topic as routine immunization and how to increase and improve financing of this strategic intervention worldwide. Um, as Dr. Chavez already said, COVID-19 severely affected or impacted population access to essential healthcare services. In the specific case of Ecuador, we have a decrease of 25% in access to essential services like famine planning, uh, nearly 20% of reduction in access to prenatal care, 36% reduction uh, in childcare, and at the level of access to routine immunization programs, we see during the pandemic a decrease of nearly 25% in the coverage of routine immunizations. And, and, and this is a catastrophe because put us at risk also of the re-emergence of several conditions that were already under control. Uh, like already Dr. Cheva said, the re-emergence of measles in the region, all the problems with migration of different populations fleeing from their countries across the region also increase this risk. And that's why during these years, part of the strategic response of many of the countries was to regain or increase the coverage to routine immunization also as a way to protect the overall health care of the population and not only look into COVID-19, but also how to increase the access to other essential health care services. Because routine immunization is also an opportunity to provide access to other packages of care that are related to immunization. You can take the opportunity while you are immunizing a child to provide family planning, prenatal care, and other healthcare services, even for chronic conditions. So in the case of Ecuador, sadly, during the pandemic, the financing allocated to the routine immunization program was diverted towards COVID-19. And that generates a big problem. Now we are, again, financing the full package of routine immunizations for the country, thanks to the PAHO Revolving Fund. Uh, we made already an investment of $106 million to guarantee that during this year and the next year, the whole population will have access to these national immunization programs, which in the case of Ecuador is free for everyone, no matter the healthcare program you have access to, routine immunization is free for everybody, including for those who are migrants and are living in the country and are not in a regular situation, they also have access to free immunization from the go. So probably this is one of the best investments all the countries in the region and worldwide can do. Thank you so much, Rodrigo. Cannot agree more with your final comment of this being one of the, the best investments. And I see Miguel taking himself off mute, so I'll go to him shortly, but let me just echo two points you also made. One is, it would be a huge mistake to say that you know, immunization is something that needs to be done in a silo. The, this whole health system strengthening approach, how do you take advantage of the opportunity of immunization to also strengthen other as aspects of health system? When you mentioned Rodrigo, that was absolutely spot on. Completely agree. And second, the point about migration. I think this adds on to Dr. Chavez, uh, Ana Elena's comments about overlapping crisis emergency. That's something that you know our region will have to deal with going forward. 
Apologies for interrupting you, Miguel. Please go ahead. No, on the contrary, thank you, Pepe. I, I, I think that uh, Dr. Chevez and, and Enriquez have highlighted uh, very important issues regarding uh, immunizations uh, and, and uh, you know, the, the, the risk of, of uh, losing uh, the gains that were so hardly won over the past decades. Uh, but also there's there's also the future, you know, the, there's new vaccines coming out uh, against uh, chronic diseases, cancer, uh, it, it, vaccines uh, almost uh, turning into immunotherapies as well. Uh, you know, the, the pandemic has shown us the, the potential of uh, new platforms like, like Moderna's uh, mRNA vaccines um, and, and another uh, innovation in, in, in the areas of, of vaccines. And, and that opens a, a huge uh, a panorama of, of the things that we can uh, use vaccines for in, in terms of improving people's health. Um, so, I mean, trying to, to uh, link it to the topic at hand, uh, which is financing, um, if, if we are not able to sustain the needs for the current routine vaccination programs and, and sustaining these coverages that Dr. Enriquez was mention, uh, mentioning as well as, as Dr. Chevez, um, we won't be able as a region to 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 move forward uh, and 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 bring in quickly this innovation and and make it accessible to our population. So I I I, I would just like to to highlight that as well, uh, and and thank you for for the the previous comments. Thank you, Miguel. And Obama, other other reaction, perhaps. Yeah, just to very maybe briefly add a couple points that I think we'll get we'll get deeper into as we move into this conversation around financing. But I think clearly what I've heard from my other distinguished panelists here is that you know we have to invest to ensure that programs are resilient, and that means that they can recover, but that they can also withstand shocks. And I think Dr. Chavez outlined, you know, it's not just the pandemic; it is the everyday shocks that that countries and communities bear. And I think, you know, a point that you raised, Pepe, is that resilience is also about surge capacity. And as countries are looking to invest in um, health security and really wanting to shore up and ensure that they are more prepared, immunizations is a cornerstone of that. And then lastly, I think, as Dr. Betancourt outlined, as we look to the future, in some ways, the current situation has really highlighted for us where investment is needed to modernize and to continue to ensure that our immunization programs are the backbone and continue to allow for the introduction of you know, new innovation um, and new ways of protecting um, populations across the life course. And so I think you know, we are at this very pivotal moment to be thinking about the investments that are needed both to recover and, and you know, build back, but also to look to the future and really leverage the different stakeholders that are investing in health or are investing in preparedness and security and how can that really help to support and not silo immunizations as you noted. Um, can we leverage those funds from COVID-19 pandemic response and really put those towards resilience and modernization of programs. So just to kind of put a fine point on those points. Thank you, Anupama, absolutely in agreement. And thank you for, for underscoring those points. Um, I guess, you know, taking taking elements of some of the issues that have already been discussed, I want to pose another question to you, Rodrigo, uh, including some of the points you mentioned yourself. Uh, I think it was great to see the progress that's been made in Ecuador so far coming back from such an extraordinary shock, so to speak. Um, but then looking ahead, we also talked about multiple speakers have talked about the need to introduce new vaccines. You know, we talked about uh, future needs of vaccination, various forms of that. Um, on the other hand, you know, we do have a situation where Ecuador is not the only case here. A lot of countries in the region are facing significant fiscal constraints. Um, so on one hand, you have growing needs in a way. And on the other hand, you have basically lower budget. How do you kind of reconcile that? That's a question that I'd love to ask you. It's something that I mentioned at the top, which is just the fact that we were able to emphasize so much so much more the health issues, the immunization issues during the pandemic. I see that as one of the at least temporary positive legacy of the pandemic. But now that we're kind of exiting that, there is that risk, at least a perception that maybe, as I mentioned earlier, health is taking a backseat again in some countries. So in your country, or at least what you've observed in the region, the second question here is, do you really see kind of a long-term shift at the budgetary level uh, that, you know, governments are, are, are dedicating more resources to issues like health and specifically immunization? 
Well, I, I think everybody worldwide is expecting that one of the main lessons of COVID-19 pandemic and, and, and other pandemics is that uh, investment in healthcare probably is one of the investment with the highest return. Uh, for the case of immunization, I think uh, we uh, as a stakeholders must really do a strong case for this really high return of investment of immunization programs. Mm -hmm. uh, it, there are certain data that for every dollar that you spend in an immunization program, the return of the investment is 21 times higher. And if you add the societal benefits, the return of the investment can be that high as $54 per every dollar that you invest. And we also have to make the case that probably for many countries in the region, especially in the Latin American and the Caribbean region, uh, financing is not the main problem. Probably we have to do the case on the politicians and all the finance sector that this really high return of investment can be achieved with less than 3% of the whole budget that you allocate to healthcare services. In the case of Ecuador, the overall cost of the routine immunization program to protect against 26 diseases with a package of 18 vaccines cost us less than 3% of all the public budget for the country. So it, it's really a, not only a problem of uh, money, of amount of money or, or financing, it's also to make a strong case for this really high return of investment. I, I think that's one of the key messages that we learned after the pandemic. And that's absolutely key, key, Rodrigo. I think a couple of thoughts I had here is that we know this is a good investment. I mean, of course, everyone on this panel agrees. So how do we support health ministries across the region to convince, in a way, their, their, their finance counterpart on the importance of that in the broader society that this is a good thing and this is something we need to continue to invest in? That's one thought I had. And second is also going back to some of the, some of the points you made earlier about making sure that we're using a basically health system strengthening approach, what I call a health system strengthening approach. And this is there's an issue there, which is how you define really immunization budget, which you know there's a data availability issue, there's a definitional issue, making sure that we're really allocating the right budget to that. And finally, I think to your point, this is not necessarily a financing issue, at least not a financing issue. And we know that at least most countries in the region were able to finance their immunization budgets fairly well up until the point of COVID. But you know, one thing that we wanted to tackle here, you know, going forward, especially taking a forward-looking approach with our with our future of health series, is that we are concerned about uh, the, the budget terror pressures that that are that are facing that many countries are facing, and this could have impact on future uh, health budgets. But anyways, with that, I'll, I'll probably perhaps turn to to Miguel. Miguel, of course, spent a lot of time thinking through some of these issues. How can we better protect and even increase health budget specific immun immunization issues? Perhaps adding a bit more nuance to what I just said and and give us some some concrete recommendations that you thought of. Uh, thanks, Pepe. Yes, uh, I mean, it's it's impressive to see how our region um, has made such an amazing effort to to develop uh, national budgets uh, for for immunizations, and and this definitely has been possible thanks to the existence of a fantastic uh, uh, mechanism represented here by Dr. Chavez uh, in 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 the in the uh, like of the uh, uh, revolving fund. Um, the the issue is that it, it, this this uh, great effort done by countries in in the idea of of having specific budgets for um, for the, for for the vaccination uh, and immunization programs uh, sometimes they they tend to focus mostly on on the acquisition of vaccines but then the actual delivery of, of the vaccines the follow up the the information systems to to be able to evaluate uh, the impact uh, to uh, generate data that will give tools to to decision makers uh, to go and discuss with finance ministries with go with with uh, national congresses uh, to obtain larger funds because there is a, a expansion of the population expansion of epidemiological needs as the the, the, the like of, that we were discussing earlier uh, so 
so so I think that that first of all we have to make sure that we have data uh, to support decision makers in in that loving, uh, uh, if I may call it, uh, exercise with those that allocate uh, uh, budget and and monies uh, to immunization programs. So so that's that's uh, that's the first part, um, and and we have then to to have this uh, capacity to do sort of of health promotion in immunization, but not aimed at the population, but aimed. Uh, again, at those individuals that have the power to to dedicate resources, and I'm talking about that uh, not uh, uh, teaching them that it's not only about getting money to buy vaccines, but that getting the vaccine to where people need it, when people need it, um, it's very expensive, it's very delicate, mm -hmm. and in the end, if you buy vaccines but you don't administer those vaccines, it's like throwing money down the drain. So you want to avoid that. Uh, so, so, so first of all, uh, then I, I would I would uh, stress this idea of of uh, of having this this capacity of interaction with with uh, uh, with, with decision makers in 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 budgetary uh, issues, uh, and then. Of course, there's the, the, the idea of having a, a legal framework that could help us support that and, and make it more uh, perdurable over time. Unfortunately, uh, we have many examples uh, all over the world in any sector that we might think of uh, in which when you have changes in, in administrations, uh, changes of political party, changes of, of uh, even, even heads of departments, uh, it's, it, there's there's this tendency to start all over again. Uh, so so that collective uh, knowledge that that has been uh, created in the past tends to to be forgotten. And in in the case of of budgeting for immunization, um, we need to have in our countries this uh, idea of of a, a, a minimum budgetary uh, level that countries should no go uh, should shouldn't go below. For the for the following uh, fiscal exercises, um, and and that 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 gives us a, a, an initial foundation, and then to establish not only a, a let's call it a bag or or a, a single uh, budgetary line that calls that, that is called vaccines or immunizations, we have to be very specific in this in in the budgetary lines. Uh, to establish uh, personal training, development of, of information platforms, uh, uh, the, the uh, elements, if possible, for the country of, of research and development um, for, for vaccines, uh, then all the, the elements of health promotion, uh, fighting against anti-vax movements and anti-vax information, um, and of course, getting the, the vaccines, updating our cold chain, uh, because of course, it, this is, I, I mean, there's, there's a certain, I wouldn't call it simplicity, but it's easier to, to, to distribute drugs usually because they, they do not have the temperature requirements that vaccines being biological elements do. So, so you need to have updated and, and, and very well checked and very well verified, uh, elements for, uh, sustaining that, that that uh, temperature needed to protect the vaccines so that they are if, uh, efficacious and safe when they are administered to the population. So, so again, this is another element that health authorities have to put on the discussion table so that finance uh, authorities understand the complexity. Um, and finally, to, to, to end this comment, I would add uh, and, and stress the issue of information. If we don't have information uh, and we just uh, talk about uh, average coverage rates at national level, uh, which is what, what we usually have as, as available data, uh, we, we forget that there are very important uh, inequities within our countries and within our region that get overshadowed in, in, uh, when, when we calculate averages. So, so we need data uh, because it won't be the same uh, element in terms of cost to distribute uh, vaccines to uh, and, and administer those vaccines at, at the capital city level uh, or the regional capital cities, uh, but we want them to go the whole nine yards and get to the people that, that usually need them the most, which are the ones that are farthest away and that have 
complications in terms of our tropical temperatures and and we have high mountains and we have the uh, the, the jungle and the rivers and and the islands so so we have all that complexity and and we need the data to support our claims that we need to have that that uh, uh, that, that that budgetary uh, support consistent with capacity and flexibility to grow over time and uh, to have also that flexibility and capacity, as I said in my previous intervention, uh, to um, allow for the introduction of new vaccines, in the introduction of new technologies, and hopefully to have, uh, and, and we just uh, saw that uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the COVID-19 pandemic, the need to have self-sufficiency in terms of research and development of vaccines, because Otherwise, we are always dependent as a region from other regions in the world. We have great exercises. We had great examples mm -hmm. with Argentina, Brazil, uh, Colombia, Mexico uh, doing part of this, but, but we need to sustain it and we need to strengthen it. So um, I would stop there um, and, 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 and I would be interested in, in, in hearing uh, what, what my colleagues in the panel have to, to comment in this regard. Thank you. If I'm... I see both hands. Uh, perhaps I'll, I'll go to uh, to Anna Elena first and Obama, if you don't mind. Yep. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to tell you that in uh, the directing PAHO directing council met in in uh, September last year, and one of the resolution they approved by them uh, actually covered all the topics that Rodrigo and Miguel had mentioned. Include, this resolution includes six strategic lines of action, and let me go through them because then you will see that definitely they are co all the topics and issues you have raised are covered. Uh, number one is to strengthen governance, leadership, and financing financing of immunization program, enhance monitoring of vaccine covers and surveillance, incorporating digital intelligence strategies into routine analysis. Strengthen the integration of immunization program into the primary, primary health care system toward universal health. Develop innovative and strategic communication approaches to build social awareness and trust in vaccine and increase access to service. Because before we thought that we didn't have issues with hesitancy or vaccine, there were no rejection. And now we find during the pandemic that it was actually an issue in our, in our region. Strengthen human resources capacity for immunization program. And finally, and I, I believe that Rodrigo will be happy to hear that the use of scientific evidence to guide decision making and program implementation, because this was uh, discussed during the evaluation in, in Ecuador, the need to develop and to conduct uh, investigation research in our organism, in our region. And I'm happy to say that Ecuador did it even during the, the pandemic. So this resolution calls to our countries to strengthen governance and leadership of immunization program combined with effective oversight, accountability, coalition building, regulation, and attention to system design to ensure adequate and efficient implementation of this policy and progress toward universal health, and ensure and protect immunization specific budgets including but not limited to the cost of vaccine and supplies, human resources and immunization operation. So everything that you have mentioned, it was captured in this, uh, uh, in this resolution. But in something that I want to build, uh, bring to the table, it's about sustainability. Yes, our countries prioritize their, their budget, but when we have a new vaccine, when this new vaccine is available, at the beginning, the price is prohibited for most countries. So we have to talk of bring as a partners, the manufacturer to make sure that this vaccine can, good vaccine can be available at better prices. Otherwise, there are countries that are not going to have access to this vaccine. We do our best from the revolving fund to make sure that these vaccines are available to all member states to the best price possible. But definitely uh, sustainability is an issue for us that we have to work together on that. Excellent points. Thank you so much. And Obama, please go ahead. 
Yeah, no, I really appreciate those comments. And I think just to maybe build on what Dr. Chavez and Dr. Betancourt said, um, I think that point of sustainability is really, really critical. And I think also this point of how are we looking at, you know, the future? I mean, as has been pointed out, Latin America has always been a leader in immunizations with you know, much of it through PAHO's leadership. And I think it's really exciting to see that PAHO has acknowledged that better investment in immunization programs, that there are changes that need to be had, whether because of the external environment is shifting, so new types of challenges such as vaccine confidence or different types of hard to reach populations or new populations that need to be addressed through immunizations requires new innovation in immunization program delivery and as well as new vaccines, which bring new technologies, new requirements for how they need to be delivered and new science at our disposal. And so this question of financing and how to ensure that that financing is sustainable, how to ensure that that financing is protected and that it can grow and allow for immunization programs to be, you know, the represent the future that we live in um, and that we will continue to live in, I think is really key. So even though we know there's a lot of political commitment and will and recognition of the value of vaccines, is how do we help to transform that to reflect the reality that we live in today and that will continue to come in the future. And so maybe just thinking a little bit about financing streams, I think, you know, again, this question of how are they sustainable and whether or not diversifying financing streams can help is an important question. And there's a wide range of options that people around the world are speaking about that includes better mobilization of domestic public sector resources. And I think in the Latin America region, that is particularly key. And the region is already innovating in mobilizing domestic public sector resources. And then we also see sort of a whole continuum of different options in, you know, depending on a country's health financing and, you know, health, um, um, health system and the challenges and needs, which bring in other sectors, private sector, donors, different types of entities that can then serve, uh, provide catalytic funding or innovative novel approaches to funding. So there is a whole continuum that I think we, we can consider and that countries should be thinking about depending on their challenges and their needs and what is appropriate and relevant for them. I think just to come back to what are some of those things we're seeing in Latin America where, again, there's a lot of best practices, there's a lot of innovation in public sector financing. I think some of it, Dr. Uh, Betancourt touched on, so legal frameworks that protect that funding and ensure that it is secure and that it can be used as and when needed for an immunization program. Um, a lot of leveraging of sin taxes or health taxes, the establishment of prevention and public health funds that help to earmark and protect funding, as well as performance-based financing models that leverage both national funding, but also subnational funding where a lot of delivery happens and allows for flexibility, but also accountability and efficiencies. And these are all things that are, are used across the region, but there's still more room to uh, optimize these models, to even innovate within these models, and to really secure that funding that is sustainable um, as well as diverse. Even coming back to something I mentioned earlier about you know, the different types of funding streams that were opened up in the, in the pandemic response, how might there be ways to better secure that to create, you know, to invest in the kind of innovation that immunization programs need, whether that's digital data systems, um, expansion of delivery sites in new ways to reach hard to reach populations, reduce inequities, or to create that space for reaching more people across the life course and adult and elderly vaccines where there's still much more room to grow and expand. Um, and so I think these are some of the things that, again, when we think about sustainable financing, diversified financing, there's a lot of um, already leadership and innovation happening in the region, but I think more opportunity to secure those, to maximize those, to optimize those, look and see where they're being underutilized. And then to complement that with something I think Dr. Enriquez said, which is how are we showing return on investment? 
and really engaging not just health officials, but elected officials, uh, finance officials, and others, and thinking about metrics that we can put in place that really demonstrate return on, an, on that investment, not just in health, but in GDP growth, on health security, on poverty and inequity, which again, I think we've been able to show, but how do we institutionalize that to better protect that funding and ensure that it continues to grow so those are just some of the comments I wanted to raise um, based off of what others have said, Pepe. No, Anubama, that, that was that was excellent. That was comprehensive. You kind of picked up and packaged a lot of points that have been mentioned previously. And I saw Rodrigo and Ana nodding their heads in different, different points. So, I mean, that was excellent. So I wanted to perhaps, based on a couple of things you said, since you mentioned some of the specific, you know, financing mechanism, whether that's, you know, what government can do on their own or in collaboration with others, Maybe you know turn to Miguel to see since we discussed this quite extensively, Miguel. What are some of these additional innovative you know financing mechanisms or strategies that you have studied? Uh, how they may or may not work in our region? What needs to be done? You know, I'd love to have you comment on that. And I do want to, in the interest of time, you know, after Miguel's response, saving the last ten minutes to talk about multi-stakeholder collaboration. Something that Jason and I said at the beginning. It's a privilege to have folks from different sectors on this panel, and I want to you know get down to the details of some of the ways we can actually work together. So Miguel, please go ahead and uh, help us with some of the, the, the financing piece before we move on to the collaboration, please. Right. Well, it it, it kind of overlaps, right? Because this, um, uh, I mean, most of, of what, and, and I guess uh, Anupama is thinking about uh, in terms of, of uh, innovation in, in funding is, is basically bringing in other sectors and bringing in other actors uh, to to the to, to to the fiscal space, if if we may call it like that. Um, so 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 the first thing that that pops up to mind, um, be, besides the efficient mobilization of, of domestic resources that we already uh, mentioned and some of the strategies that we could use for that, but but it, it, let's uh, it, the first the first thing that comes to mind is public private partnerships. Uh, there there are several examples out there uh, in which the 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 private government, the, the private sector uh, works with the government. Uh, it can be uh, to uh, to immunize or help immunize uh, specific sectors of the population. For instance, uh, we, we can we can talk about insured groups, uh, industry related. Uh, we can also think about uh, uh, supporting specific elements of of the of the whole vaccine procurement and and delivery processes so so we we, we can see uh the private sector uh chipping in on in, in distribution or in in the update of cold chain or or in the procurement of specific vaccines that can be uh important for workers in specific regions for instance so so it's it's a matter of of uh, of looking at win-win situations in which uh it's it's for the benefit of 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 the private sector for the benefit of civil society and of course support as we all need to do uh governments to be able to achieve this uh, uh ever increasing and and demanding goals of of maintaining and sustaining high coverage uh of vaccines so so public private partnerships would be uh again uh, first first uh in mind but then we also have um additional uh, innovative financing mechanisms, uh, the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, other um, uh, uh, multilateral institutions that are working around uh, uh, development and, and social uh, uh, enhancement are working on this type of strategies. And, and we can mention a couple of them. Results-based financing. There is, there is a debate around results-based financing it generates some, uh, sometimes some uh, perverse uh, incentives, but there are other important examples and 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 good examples of how uh, whether it's it's uh, international funders with national governments or is national governments uh, with local uh, health providers. Uh, in the end, the 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 message and 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 the 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 core within uh resource based financing is i give you money to to achieve a goal we set a goal we we set it uh in agreement and if the goal is achieved uh which is what we all want to to get to uh then there is a there is an incentive that can be uh, a monetary incentive a uh, 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 bulk uh, or or a, a, some sort of element uh so one concrete example that i can mention is this idea that that has been 
uh, discussed in the, in in the past um, th that you you could use the money, for instance, from the revolving fund uh, to to do what already happens, which is purchasing the vaccines. But then you add a little element of of uh, of, of incentive so that if the government achieves the set goals, the set coverage goals, uh, then you get a bonus uh, to update cold chain. No, so so it can be. As, as simple uh, as that, uh, or it can be a, a larger, uh, more organized uh, kind of, of uh, RBF system uh, in which you can get international donors, uh, go through uh, international organizations, in our case, uh, could be PAJO, for instance, or COMISCA in Central America or uh, others, um, and then uh, set these regional goals uh, try to close gaps, identify gaps between the best off and the well uh, and the less well off, and and see what it takes to close the coverage gaps and 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 the outreach uh, elements of vaccination, um, and uh, have these incentive elements at, at the end. So of, of course, um, again, as, as 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 I said, uh, there is a, a an ongoing debate of, uh, on whether uh, results based financing uh, sometimes uh, brings in. Uh, in inadequate uh, practices, but I guess that that with the the participation of uh, international organizations and 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 strong governmental regulation, we can ensure that that this this uh, uh, wrong uh, elements do not occur. So so that that would be um, the 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 second element that I would mention. And and finally, um, and, and I. I mean, I would invite you to to re read the document, uh, but in in terms of of time and and the importance of of uh, listening to to the other elements that you mentioned, we have um, more uh, specific financing, innovative financing mechanisms such as impact bonds, advanced market commitments, and and credit uh, guarantees. Um, this. These have been extensively used in vaccination all over the world. Uh, we're talking about elements uh, that Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, uh, uses. For instance, it, ha it has been used for uh, pneumococcal vaccine, the introduction of pneumococcal vaccine. So th that's that's a, a sound example uh, in, in a in a worldwide uh, perspective. But we can translate that and adapt it to uh, local and, and national uh, scenarios, and and also. And and this has to do and 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 it's 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 great to have here a representative of the of the uh, pharmaceutical industry and the vaccine manufacturers, which is this uh, element of advanced mar mar market commitments. Uh, the revolving fund does a lot of that. It, it, it does a, a great job at at securing uh, uh, accessible prices uh, for vaccines and supplies. Uh, but I guess that that uh, with a vision of incorporation of new vaccines, there's there's some work that that could be done there. Uh, both in a, in a regional perspective or uh, go uh, country by country or, or sub-regional uh, elements uh, to, to work uh, bilaterally with, with uh, manufacturers. So um, again, as, as I said, there, there's, uh, there's a lot of information behind all this. Uh, there's, there's also, and, and, and Upama was, was also mentioning, there's, there, there are so many uh, examples and things. And, and I would just finish saying we have to think outside of the box. Right, there's there is a need for money, uh, and sometimes money is out there. We just don't know how to really access it. So, so this type of of innovation in financing uh, will help us tap into that. And and I think that these or the organizations represented here and and national governments are very well positioned in Latin America and the Caribbean to support this type of of uh, of, of innovation. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I mean, providing the details, the nuances that exactly I was kind of looking for on some of the specific ideas that's mentioned and also describing some additional ones that you have studied. And, and, and thank you for making my job as moderator much easier, as you kind of already touched on, on some of these collaborative issues. You talked about public-private partnership. You talked about the important role of, of PAHO, the revolving fund specifically. And here we are. We got we got all, all the stakeholders here to talk about that. Um, in the interest of time, I'll ask everyone to be to relatively concise and 
consider this perhaps your concluding comment talking about the collaboration angle uh, keep it to one or two minutes and perhaps we'll start off with uh, with, with Anna to, to talk about you know the multilateral space you know how can PAHO's revolving fund which is such an important which already has played such an important role further even better support countries in some of these immunization and health efforts and then we'll we'll turn to Anu Obama and perhaps since we started off with Rodrigo in this conversation we'll close off with him as well to, to provide some final thoughts but uh, Anna please go ahead yes just before my final thoughts, I, you know, I just want to mention to Miguel that everything that you had mentioned, we have an, a very good example of uh, Rotary International, the collaboration, their commitment with polio eradication, it was there and it has been there for more than 40, 30 years. So yes, we have to think out of the box. Yes, we have to innovate, but we have to look at the past, our history, and that ex good example that we can follow. Now, regarding the my, my last thought is, uh, well, when somebody else talk about the good job that the revolving fund is doing, it is much easier for us, definitely. Uh, Pajo Revolving Fund has been supporting countries for over 40 years, and currently 41 countries and territories are purchasing their vaccine, syringes, and other supplies through this mechanism. I'm happy to say that the revolving fund is not just a procurement mechanism, it's a uh, cooperate, technical, provides technical cooperation to the country and sustainability is our main concern. Uh, our, the fund has been fundamental pillar for the achievement of, of the great milestone in public health in the region. And we are happy to keep, keep supporting countries to add new vaccine, to introduce new vaccine, but also to, to keep those that, have, that are, are able to keep our region polio free, measles free and rubella free. However, challenges remain, such as security and protecting immunization specific budgets, including but not limited to the cost of vaccines and supplies, as I mentioned before. So there is a lot of work that needs to be done. Yes, think out of the box, but also learning from our experience and our lesson learned. Thank you. Thank you, Anubama, we'll go to you. Great, no, thank you. I mean, I think just reflecting from the perspective of Merck as a biopharmaceutical company that has been investing in innovative vaccines for you know more than 125 years you know the sustainability of immunization programs and their ability to reach people um, is paramount to you know how we think about how we're uh, where our products are going and how they need to um, how they can improve health and well-being and so I think you know a key role that we seek to play is to see how can we partner whether that's governments that's healthcare systems that's other stakeholders who are part of this vaccine ecosystem and Helping, helping to strengthen and, and make sure that programs are sustainable and that we can continue to innovate so that we're meeting the needs, whether that's new diseases, whether that's new ways of delivering immunizations, whether that's new ways of um, you know, innovating on the cold chain and having vaccines that can be more effectively administered in hard to reach populations in areas with, with uh, poor infrastructure. Um, and that takes partnership and it takes open dialogue and trust and you know, really understanding what the needs are of governments and countries in uh, wanting to address the needs of their population and how we can be a partner in that. So thank you. Thank you, Anupama. Rodrigo, we'll go to you. Some final reactions from your reflections. Well, thank you for this wonderful panel. Uh, I think some of the key messages for us are, in the first place, vaccines per se do not save lives. Immunization programs do. And, and that's why we have to have this, this broad and comprehensive approach that is not just the vaccines, is how people get access to them and are immunized. Uh, my second thought is that any solution must look at the whole life cycle of these technologies that we call vaccines. Uh, for example, uh, I think that governments needs to increase their participation, financing with public funds, research and innovation. Mm -hmm. So they can also then ask some flexibilities with intellectual property. Because sometimes we have this discussion between private versus public goods and probably vaccines and many other healthcare technology are more married goods because they have high uh, externality, positive externalities. So any solution must be really comprehensive and try to be a solution that involves all the relevant stakeholders. 
from the financing perspectives, in many of our countries, we already are doing tax reforms for earmarking resources for healthcare aspects. In Ecuador, for example, we finance cancer doing a tax reform and earmarking these resources for cancer. Why we cannot do the same for other technologies like vaccines that probably have a higher return of investment. So uh, those are some of my comments and thank you for this wonderful plan. Rodrigo, thank you so much. We're obviously thrilled that, you know, uh, from the government perspective, you found this conversation useful and we, we will look forward to continue to engage you, your colleagues at the, uh, the health ministry um, and of course other health ministries finance ministries and other relevant government ministries and officials around the region. And just once again, thank you to all of you, the, the speakers, your comments. We really learned a lot from each and every one of you. And I'll be dismissed. I'll be remiss not to thank also my amazing team, especially Eva Lardizaba, who helped put together this event. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, have a wonderful rest of the evening. And we look forward to keeping in touch and continuing discussing the conversation, continuing discussing this topic. And this is really just the beginning. Thank you so much, Pepe, and to the Atlantic Council. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to everybody.